everybody. Happy post Thanksgiving, happy holidays, something or other. And you all made it here. So I'm so excited to talk to you about these two wonderful films, which could not be more different from each other. And I think it says a lot about your range and your career that you have these two great films that are totally different. Um, Noah Baumbach's Marriage Story with Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson, as you may know, and you play the fashionable shark of a lawyer for Scarlett's character. And Greta Gerwig's Little Women, the beloved Marmy. So let's start with Marriage Story. I know that Noah had talked to Scarlett and Adam even before he finished the screenplay and sort of incorporated a lot of their conversations into what he was doing. Did you come in that early too? How did I did. Um, about a year and a half before he gave me the script, we started conversations in and around the subject of building his next movie and wanting to tell a love story. Um, and, sh and we were friends but had never worked together. And shortly into those conversations, a few months in, he said, I think I want to explore a love story within the lens of a divorce, which I thought was incredibly brave and um, heartbreaking and irreverent and all the things that the movie has, has since become. Um, and yeah, we all started talking, sharing, as he talked to friends, as he talked to lawyers and judges, um, as I'm sure he talked to you about, as he was sort of building this story. But he, amidst the story of this family, I think he really also wanted to explore the business of divorce. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens institutionally um, when individuals have this trajectory and then someone or the industry mm -hmm. of divorce steps in and says, actually, we're going to take a sharp left turn and completely mm -hmm. disassemble your life, even though you thought you'd be friends, um, which, of course, was the great luxury I had uh, in, in getting to represent that whole system, not mm -hmm. just one individual, I think. What conversations did you have with him about that character as you were starting in? Well, we met a few attorneys here in New York, but particularly in LA, and learning about and meeting female divorce lawyers in Los Angeles was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, it is its own machine, and one, one where your celebrity is built on the celebrity you represent or the celebrity you take on. It's a very odd kind of business. Um, and fascinating in how the women that I talk to um, working in and around a business that's outrageously male-dominated, um, female attorneys in general, but particularly in family law, come in maybe with high hopes about how they're going to be more empathic or protect their client or protect the children involved, but the nature of that business breeds um, a whole other set of agendas. Um, and so learning how they use their femininity even um, as a tool to sort of win a case is very weird and fantastic for an actor to watch. <laughs> well, that's a perfect setup for the first clip we have from the film, which is the scene where your character, Nora, is meeting Scarlett Johansson's character for the first time and basically trying to sell herself as her divorce attorney. So let's take a look at that. Calling her doll is such a perfect touch in that scene. Was that in the script or would that come up later? Uh, I think it was in the script, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Noah's script is truly the most perfect script I've read that I've been able to be part of, where you're given this gift like a extraordinary playwright gives us, right? And then you're just mining from there all the places emotionally you can go, but everything is laid out for you. I mean, from 
if anybody who's seen the film would see that my, I kick my high heels off and tuck my feet underneath myself and jump, hop a certain way next to her. And it's literally described in the screenplay. Oh, um, he just, the way he uh, envisions as a filmmaker the narrative while he's writing is just so amazing. And I, I'm like such a, I was such an insane fan of Noah Baumbach, and now I'm even more rabid because I just, watching him at work be so effortless and so encouraging and so collaborative while stealthily knowing exactly what he needed at all times to tell this story was just amazing, amazing. Well, you actually have a very tricky role, I think, because there's so much wit in here, more than you could see in that sort of truncated clip. But it's very funny, and then it gets serious. So was it hard to kind of balance that so that you've got the wit without making her a caricature? Um, people always ask when you're doing an interview about your acting life or whatever, you know, what is it that you particularly love or look for or long for or feel like you've done more of? So if there is one thing <laughs> that I am for whatever reason obsessed with as a, as a film lover, as an audience, but also as an actor is the very thing you just described. I love finding um, the irreverent humor or truth in some kind of broken, deeply messy place. Um, you know, I love it in life, you know, I, I and, and, and it's so amazing how little of it we've had in film. So when we get it, it's so delicious. If, you know, all of us having been through heartbreak, when you're watching movie after movie and then there's the movie where someone is just laughing hysterically because it's so bad how mm -hmm. he left her. And, and you just, there's something so relatable about mm -hmm the hilarity of heartbreak versus, you know, something very maudlin. And um, so I always found that, even as a kid, so refreshing um, in storytelling. And so I think that's why I always pine for that. Um, so this was, you know, such a dreamy gift, that very nuanced thing of a character that kind of lives between both. She also says this is an act of hope, is that true or is it a line that she's trying to sell the character or maybe both? I think it's both. I think that's what's so complicated about these people who show up in our lives, mm -hmm. who have great advice but poor intentions, right. you know? Yeah. Um, she's sort of like that. Well, that's what I thought the first time I saw the film, that, oh, she's right, but you don't expect her to be right because she's somebody who, from the start, is just trying to sell herself and her you know, access to celebrity and everything else. Yeah, and ultimately to win your case, which is what you right. hire her to do. Yeah. But oh. she's going to do it in every, you know, use every manipulative tool she can to get it done, which is really complicated. So you, I, I mean, what I love is he's written a character for Scarlett that I think feels like she's always playing catch up with her own lawyer and supposed to be grateful, but her life's falling apart. Mm -hmm. It's... Um, you know, it's, I, it feels very accurate of most people's experience um, when, when dealing with particularly high-powered lawyers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Noah has talked about his own divorce, sort of being into this, not in a strictly autobiographical way, but just in general. Mm -hmm. And Scarlett was going through a divorce herself when he gave her the script. You've been through divorce. Did that all feed into the character in some way, or did she just seem like a different person, the character? I mean, she did, but it all fed into it. There wasn't a member of the crew or cast who hadn't experienced divorce, whether it was in childhood, their own, their yeah. sisters, their mothers. You know, it's, um, it is, given the statistics, it's pretty much a part of most of our lives in some way, or has touched our family in some way. So everybody felt very personal about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think for me, the thing that broke my heart the most, because I, come, I came at it as a kid who had been through it, but also then as a parent, 
is Adam Driver, who's so brilliant in this movie. We were talking about it back there a little bit ago. Um, he's just, everybody's work and Scarlett, they're so beautiful in the movie, but um, he says to his lawyer, played by Alan Alda, I want him to know that I fought for him. Yeah. And that line just kills me that in, in the mess of, mm -hmm. of all of this, the kid, the child will never know the true story of, first of all, of the love story that the child mm -hmm. came from, if, if they're very young in this case. Um, and that is, you know, really interesting journey mm -hmm. to take that Noah looked at in Squid and the Whale as well and looks at this from the, not only the parenting perspective, but also this, this business of divorce perspective. Yeah. Let's take a look at another clip. This is later on in the film, and you and Scarlett are in a hallway waiting to go into um, the, the courtroom. And he, to this point, we've seen Alan Alda as this very sweet old attorney, and suddenly Adam Driver walks in with a different attorney, Ray Liotta. Let's take a look. <laughs> As soon as I said Ray Liotta, you all laughed. Did you know that he was going to be the she was going to be the tough guy attorney? Uh, well, I must say the casting is amazing, and to imagine Alan Alda as your lawyer and then you choose Ray Liotta <laughs> pretty much says a lot about, about that part of the yes, story and about lawyers. But the, the, there's not a lawyer who comes out of here really looking great. I have to say, right? No. <laughs> even, I mean, even though Alan Alda, I, I love him so much, yeah. but uh, yeah, ultimately. Uh, now his character is great, choice. but but he can't he can't win. I mean, that's really yeah. what the what the film is saying that the nice yeah. guy lawyer with the best intentions, who's really humane, just can't win. Yeah, uh, you guys have to see this movie. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's such a great movie. Yeah, I love this movie so beautiful. much. And the audiences love this movie. It was at the Venice Film Festival, and ever since then, people are weeping at the end. And it's not a sad ending, but people are really emotionally touched by it in a way they are by very few films, I think. Yeah. And I wonder if you have a sense of why that is. It's not just because we've all been through breakups. There are lots of breakup movies or divorce movies, but what, do you have a sense of why it touches people so much? I, I think, you know, Noah's work, both in his writing and in his direction, are it's so deeply personal mm -hmm. that there's nothing between you and these characters. Mm -hmm. And it's why I became an actor, watching my parents are both actors and watching them work with Hal Ashby and Scorsese and seeing what it meant to have those movies where you were in the experience with those characters. There was nothing distancing you from the experience. It, it was yours to have. Whatever you needed as is you know, great songwriting to project onto that at any given moment in your life, it's there for the taking. It's a gift to you specifically. I mean, that's what's so beautiful about great movies, and I do believe that Noah's captured that. Beyond the subject matter, mm -hmm. he's captured the essence of what it is to be a flawed person trying to figure it out, and that's, that's a gorgeous um, thing to have. So that's why I love the movie so yeah, much. Yeah, and, and it is rare. There is that real sense of intimacy yeah. that you feel with those characters. But you don't get a song. Scarlett and Adam each have songs. They uh, sing in yeah. here. Did you lobby to get a song? Well, I must say, the, I think the whole script, and we'll talk about it with another movie, because um, there's another filmmaker I worked with who's equally um, focused on the rhythm and sound of language, um, almost identically to this filmmaker, interestingly. They should know each other, because they have a lot <laughs> in common. Um, but, with both films, and, and while we're speaking with this one, there really is a musicality. And as Noah's talked about, the, the movie is in its own way this, this sort of musical mm -hmm. um, in, in how performance is used. And so they actually have songs that, that speak to the storytelling. Mm -hmm. But for myself and Ray Liotta, we have, for example, a courtroom scene 
that it feels like a musical number. I mm -hmm. mean, every line was written so that my third word has, was where he begins and I have to finish simultaneously with him while the clerk then talks over that fourth line. It was such a dance and so meticulously rehearsed so that it really did have the rhythm of language um, in, in, you know, in speaking to what it is like to be, as she said, a dogfight, to be at battle in this proscenium called court. Um, but again, everything is a performance and it's about the theater director and an actress and, and um, Adam and Scarlett's characters. So lawyers are, are a perfect example of those who perform uh, their role as well. Um, and that was amazing to get right and to act out and, and to be a company like you would mm -hmm. on a play. Um, so that in rehearsals, all of us, even though we were in different parts of the movie, were all rehearsing scenes so that we all had kind of a si similar rhythm, yeah. um, which was, yeah, really cool to work like that. Well, let's talk about Little Women. Um, you all know that Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach are a real couple in life. That's Did, why I uh, alluded yes, to that. Exactly. Interesting. And you all laughed, so I knew that you got that. Um, so how did that happen? Did one of them nudge the other and say, you should they work fell with Laura Dern? Oh, why? Uh, how, <laughs> no, how <laughs> working with me um, Where did you come into the picture in the relationship? I um, <laughs> somehow have become their adoptive child <laughs> this last year. And I'm going to keep it that way because I love them and I love working with them so much. Uh, and we became friends. Um, Noah and I became friends. He's a, a great admirer of David Lynch, and we sort of met through a screening of a David Lynch film and kind of immediately felt like family. And um, simultaneously, I met Greta. We, we met sort of at a party and I can't remember if I had just seen Greenberg, but I had seen her uh, work, just the beginning of, of seeing her work and then saw her in Greenberg. And we kind of came running up to each other and said, it's so weird, I've never said this to anybody before, but I watch you on screen, and we were saying it to each other simultaneously, and you really remind me of myself. Like, no one's ever talked so much with their hands, and we're so gangly, and our arms are so long, and we're a little bit goofy, and we're, um, you know, play complicated characters, whatever it was. And we really did feel this sort of kindred spirit with our physicality and um, our kind of natures on, on screen. And, she had felt that, she had said for a long time, watching me as she was you know, figuring out wanting to be an actor and all of that. So, um, so we had that connection. And then as we all became friends, there was a continual conversation. What are we gonna do together? Was it gonna be all of us together was one mm -hmm. presumption. Not the glorious um, beginnings which was working with both of them in radically diverse roles in the same year back to back, which just sort of fell into place. So that was amazing. Um, and when uh, Greta started her film Lady Bird, she and I had lunch and she was like, guess what, I found another weirdo. There's this girl named Sir Sharon, and she's as weird as we are, and she talks with her hands a lot, too. We'll have to do a movie someday where you're relatives, or we're all relatives. So um, now we've we found ourselves, and it's true. She is equally weird. And, and she's your daughter here. So, Yeah, she plays my daughter, and she is incredible in Little Women, and Greta has made a truly a perfect movie. It Just is wonderful. An absolutely gorgeous movie. I can't wait for you all to see it. Right, that's coming out at Christmas time, so you probably haven't seen that yet. But it is a wonderful adaptation. And it's interesting because it's a period piece, but it feels very contemporary. And that was, you know, for, for many of us probably, we've seen more than one version of Little Women. Um, but I think that was the longing Greta had was to feel the revolution of Louisa May Alcott in her adaptation. 
And for Greta, it's about as much as it's about, and I'm sure you'll agree, the story of Little Women, it's really Luisa's story. Mm -hmm. And Marmy is a real blend of the Marmy in the book and Louisa May Alcott's real mother. We did an immense amount of research, Greta did in her adaptation, and then we moved to Concord, Massachusetts, where they're from, and spent from September to Christmas there, all of us living there together and reading all their letters and you know spending time literally in the spaces that they inhabited and that was just incredible and I learned so much more about Marmy that reminded me of the Marmy that was written in the book mm -hmm. and it's so radical and it's so revolutionary but as we think back it's like oh it's great American literature and they're all so happy, and she's such an angelic mother, and the girl, the sisters, and they love each other. It's like, actually, it's super messy, incredibly complicated. They're living in abject poverty, and the mother, as we learned, was such a radical. Louisa May Alcott's mother was America's first social worker. She was an abolitionist. Their home during Little Women, as she was writing it, was part of the Underground Railroad. And they were radicals. She was Margaret Fuller's assistant who wrote the first kind of feminist manifesto oh, yeah. in America. And they were all living in this tiny town of Concord. She was writing Little Women. Across the street, Emerson was writing. Their neighbor, Thoreau, was on Walden Pond that's like half a block from here literally writing one of the most important books in history. And Nathaniel Hawthorne lived on the corner and was writing The Scarlet Letter and Margaret Fuller. They were literally living in a two block radius, all writing that same year. It's so amazing, isn't it? Um, and there was like a revolution in Lincoln and They're stuff. <laughs> um, so it was such a radical time. And I think to Greta, and once we dove deeper in to us, that felt quite similar to a lot that we are experiencing today. Interesting. Uh, and what it is to be a young person and a young woman and find voice and figure out who you are uh, and to talk about women in the workplace and women as artists and women and money, mm -hmm. which is a big theme in the film. and publishing and you know mothers and daughters um, and and being an independent human and not being defined by a love story like all of that was in this one unbelievable novel and I think she's really found all those themes um, within her movie so I'm I'm privileged to be part of it well, it is a great ensemble cast, too. Let's take a look at one scene, which is pretty self-explanatory, but if you don't know who all the actors are in it, um, Saoirse Ronan is Joe, Florence Pugh is Amy, Eliza Scanlon is Beth, and Emma Watson is Meg. You could not have a better cast than that. Mm -hmm. And she is Marmy. Let's take a look. What I love, it's interesting showing that clip. What I love that you don't see is, is the petulance in it, the like resentment in it, not mm -hmm. just the, like, oh, of course, Marmy, yeah. here, let's go do an act of service. Like she really captures, yeah. uh, you know, what it is to be human and trying to, you know, but I mean, can we have a piece of bread before we start giving <laughs> to the neighbors? Um, which you feel when you're reading the book. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, you know, I love the way she's captured all of it and its complication. Did you love the book when you were a girl or not? I did. I read it late. Um, I mean, I read it as a teen, and so I. It was easy for me to relate to Joe, mm -hmm. and I loved Marmy, and I was an only child being raised by a single mother. So that relationship was the book for me, and I'd never read a book um, that shared kind of a very wise experience of this mother-daughter relationship and all its complications. So that really struck me. So I felt particularly moved to play Marmy. Um, and, and to build the relationships with these amazing actors, 
and I include Timmy Chalamet, who plays the neighbor, who's a gorgeous character and human being. And um, all of the young people in it who make her mother or the mother figure, you know, you, ha you had kids young anyway then, particularly young compared to now. And so what I love is Louise May Alcott also writes and navigates that, those relationships. Like one minute she's the mother, then one of the daughters is mothering her, then they're like sassy siblings sort of fighting over something, then she's rather pious, then she's angry. That it, it's, relationship is relationship. No one plays one role in a family ever. Um, and movies haven't always gotten that right. And so her writing is so extraordinary in that way. Um, so hopefully we, we just continue to let her be our muse and, and try to bring that to, to fruition. And your character takes a lot of different turns, which here she does seem like the kind of saintly marmy, but there are a lot of different turns in the film mm -hmm. where she's a much more complicated character. And as you say, the family is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and what was, the, what was the atmosphere like on set? Were you the mother figure or not? All of it. I mean, I think I was at times, um, particularly for some of the girls and not for others, but I definitely became the person that they would come to. Um, I think partly purposely, you know, as actors, like we were building a family. And most importantly, you know, what I find so fascinating and delicious about being a mom myself is like your limbs are no longer your own when you have children. They're just climbing on you at all times. And um, there's a real boundarylessness to that relationship between a mother and child. And um, so we established that on day one. And uh, you'll see it. I mean, you'll see the comfort, I think particularly with Sersha and Eliza, they're just always literally like hanging on me um, and it's you know it I think adds so much to to our scenes together um, but they were also confidants and you know I mean Sersh is from Ireland people I'm from Santa Monica California <laughs> when it was four degrees and we were filming outside she was definitely mothering me <laughs> when I was like Greta I know in the book she like gives her coat and her scarf to the poor people next door, but like, is there any way I could have a coat in the scene? No, you can't have a coat. She gives away everything. Oh, right, right, okay, I was just asking. Because um, I was freezing all the time. It was horrible. <laughs> it's really fun and horrible. <laughs> all worked out in the end. Um, we have another clip that shows a different side of the character. Um, okay, and this is after um, Joe has had a kind of emotional meltdown. So let's take a look at that one because it'll show a whole other side of the character. That's so different. Where did that come from? Would, I don't remember if that was in the book or not. Was it's, any of that? It is, to, I mean, to the word, which is just amazing and also speaks to Greta, not only in her adaptation, but the time she wanted to take for us to have rehearsal, which mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but in the olden days, <laughs> when they made movies, you had rehearsal. <laughs> and now you show up like the day before you start filming. Um, but it is, in fact, no joke, a deep luxury in filmmaking now. And we really had two solid weeks of just playing with text and pulling scenes from the book that weren't in the script, e even to inform other scenes or to lift and, and put back into the script. Um, and you go back and you read some of the things, particularly that Joe and Marmy say to each other. It's just amazing, because it's not necessarily what we've seen or what we remember. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and conversations about a love story and sexuality and wanting to be free and not be defined by anybody and loving whoever you want, men, women, whatever you, you know, like you go back to the language of little women, it's, it's radical, radical, 1860s. It's very, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing book to read again now. And as adults, you know, to go back and sort of 
reconsider what she was talking mm -hmm. about. And, I, and the fact that, and I don't want to give too much away, but the fact that Greta gives you the roadmap not only to this revolution, but to Luisa's revolution and the world she was up against in just trying to get the book made. Because mm -hmm. it, it really is a blending of her story and, and the story of Little Women. Right, you'll see it's kind of layered with the, the um, attempt to get a novel published, so it's sort of the story within the story. Mm -hmm. But it really resonates a lot today with, yeah. with, as you said, with women and success and all of that. Yeah. Did you make up any kind of backstory for Nora, uh, the character in Marriage Story, or Marmy that we haven't, haven't seen or read about? Is, um, that, is that the way you work as an actor to create the backstory for your characters? You know, it all depends. In the case of Marmy, I was just feeding off of who she was, the actual mother, and trying to get as close to her as possible. And Nora, um, you know, meet a few divorce lawyers and you don't really have to create a backstory. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did, Noah and I together did, because we found it much more interesting that she, it was important to me that she had a, a some kind of good intention mm -hmm. to go into the business of family law, that she was gonna be the one that was gonna do it differently. Mm -hmm. She was going to look out for the child. She was going to look out for women when their voices aren't being considered in this dissolution of marriage. And um, and I and I believe in the case of Nora or the Noras that I was sort of basing my ideas around. That it's very much the truth. Um, but commerce really muddies things, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, so, right. Well, these are just the two most recent things in your great career. We have to talk about Big Little Lies. Yeah. Which, sure. <laughs> and your character, Renata, really was a breakout character. Did that surprise you? Because she really sort of took off as the iconic character from that series. I mean, I am so, uh, I don't want to say I'm selfish. I just want to say I love her. <laughs> so if anyone loved her as much as I did, then it wouldn't be surprising because how do we not love a character that has just in her experience or her narcissism has had to live in this man's world for so long, you know, being this corporate mucky muck and competing with the big boys and being a woman of power when no one else let you do that. And then you show up in an environment where there might be a girlfriend to lean on and no one will be your friend. And you might have a little anger issue. Um, <laughs> just a little. Uh, a little we could go anywhere. And as an actor, how amazing. Like there was never a scene that was handed to me that we were gonna just end there. We had to go everywhere. And that's so fun. No take was the same, no, you know, no opportunity was impossible. Um, you know, no director would say, well, I had two directors, they would never say no to what Renata would feel at any given moment. That's just delicious. And you were on a set there where most of the cast was made up of these very high-powered women. Um, the same with Little Women. Did you see a difference when you're on a set that were the cast is mostly women or not? Huge difference. I mean, huge difference in that I've, I did my first movie at 11 and there was one woman on the entire crew. My scenes were with men, my makeup and hair was done by men, but there was a female script supervisor. Of course. And that was it. And I was 11. What film was and there that? Was, it was called Foxes, Fox. and there was no one really to talk to. Mm -hmm. And then I, there, we had a party scene, and then there were actresses. And I was like, oh, great. You know, I can talk to these other girls, you know, because you're 11, you're not going to talk to the boys. That's mm -hmm. terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think from that moment, you know, I always longed to have, you know, matriarchal, 
figures around me and girlfriends to talk to. Um, not about the creative process. Some, some of my most amazing experiences have, and collaborations have been with male directors, female directors. It's not about that. I mean, everybody, every individual brings something to it. it, it I think we should get rid of that stuff, sort of, I mean, now she's a director, but a woman, how is that? You know, like, it's, it's, she's a mate, Greta's amazing, and Martha Coolidge is amazing, and Joyce Chopra was amazing, I've been, Andrea Arnold's amazing, like, they bring themselves to the work, but when you're on a set, day in, day out, let me start by saying, with all due respect to men whom I love, I've never had so many snacks. <laughs> in my life because you get a group of women together and they are feeding each other they are checking on each other and with myself Nicole Kidman and Reese Witherspoon we're raising kids together so it was like oh my god do you not have a pickup let me get da, da, da. I'm gonna have I mean Reese's daughter was babysitting mine then Nicole's kids needed a play date and they came over to our house like it was just amazing to work in a workplace environment with other women. I hadn't had that until more recently. And that's just lovely to have that kind of support as you're figuring out life and raising children and, you know, and needing snacks. Needing snacks, right. Well, we have two questions here about Enlightened, which is a great series that, that you starred in, directed and created by Mike White. Um, one of them is, please talk about Enlightened. We loved your character. Do you love making it? Rosalie asked. And this says, it was great watching you work with your mom in Enlightened. Is there anything special special you learned by working with your mom? Ooh, Diane okay. Lane, of course. So starting with Enlightened in general, um, I uh, was deeply interested in playing a character who um, because of her filterless nature um, and hair trigger at times, um, would make a mess likely of her life, but would also bring voice to the truth. And maybe, in turn, make the world a better place while also being a shit show. Like, that was hilarious and felt really accurate to me. Um, and so that was a character that I started working on and, and um, developing. And thank God HBO was as interested as I was in that. And um, it was right after the 2000 election and, and uh, pre the dawn of the iPhone revolution where people weren't marching in the streets and weren't sharing information in the same way. And so the question was, what does it take to find people who will get in the street and like blow up everything just to make a difference? And I thought it could be very amusing that it was a character like Amy Jellico. And Mike White um, agreed to so brilliantly write this amazing show. And if anybody hasn't seen it, I think it's the most relatable character currently that we could have. I really think she's, this is her moment. <laughs> Amy is, was, was built to um, be there for us. When we made it and I was doing press the first season, I had journalists and a couple female journalists go, so she's bipolar and like, what is her insanity? Like what kind of, like, well, she's not crazy. She's just really angry and fed up. No, 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 she's really mentally ill. No, she's not mentally ill. <laughs> Until I became mentally ill in defending her. Um, but she, <laughs> what do you mean she seems crazy? She's an amazing, normal girl. Um, but, <laughs> and, and interestingly, the pilot is around a sexual harassment case in the workplace and HR and so it, she, it was just a little bit ahead of its time but I think it's a really fun thing to discover now because she would have had a field day with our current politics um, and I think it's a kind of homage to the horrors of big food. There's a 
definite messaging toward Monsanto and others in there long before it was sort of maybe in the news as prevalently. So I feel very proud of that. Um, wish we could do more with Amy. Who knows? But, um, and then in the case of working with my mother, it's truly, truly one of the greatest gifts of my life. I mean, to be raised as an only child by your mom who's an only child, to have that kind of closeness, um, and such a deep and lucky love story with her. And she's your muse and your hero growing up. And then we did a David Lynch film, Wild at Heart, together. We did a beautiful film Martha Coolidge made called Rambling Rose together. Um, she and I found each other here and there, like cameos in a couple of things. She shows up in Citizen Ruth in a very funny scene, um, almost unrecognizably. That's one of the funniest scenes I've ever been in. Um, and then Enlightened. And to work with your mom at 20 and then again at you know 40 or whatever I was, was amazing. Um, I think I was much more capable at, you know, as a 40-year-old to really take in the blessing of not only the gift of who she is as an actor, but her professionalism and everything she had to teach me and yet be really separate individuals. Because when you're 20, you're still thinking that everyone's defining you based on your parents or something, or I did. Um, so there was more autonomy and therefore, I think, much more an immense gratitude. And for anybody who hasn't seen Enlightened, as wonderful as my character is and as great a show as it is, my mother gives one of the most amazing performances I've ever seen of anybody, especially because she's a really like, deliciously complimentary, engulfing, Laura's a genius, Laura's my miracle kind of mother, and she plays the most <laughs> shut down, <laughs> like disinterested and kind of awful, disconnected <laughs> mother to me. Um, so it's just amazing to, to play out those characters together. It is really an amazing series if you haven't seen it. This is a question we haven't gotten to. Um, you have a production company. Um, what do you love about producing and what are the projects you're working on now? My producing partner, Jamie Lemons, who I think is here tonight somewhere. Right there. Oh, she's right there. Um, and um, she wrote. I was going to ask if you wrote this Jamie, question. Jamie from right. Jamie. What? There's are no name on it, Jamie just so you know. It's anonymous doing currently. Um, um, you know, I I think that it's an exciting time. Um, and it has been since the 40s for women to want to make content um, that's human and empathetic and has interesting and complicated, flawed female characters. I mean, I say that because I, I know Betty Davis worked very hard to do this. Um, Jane Fonda was an extraordinary producer starting in film and television in the 70s. So um, we're, we're not reinventing the wheel but we are amongst uh, a group of artists um, who are trying to make content that matters. And in our case, we're doing it in documentary film and limited series, TV series. We're, we're you know, have a number of projects that we're super excited about. Doing a documentary, Jamie's Leaving Tomorrow, about Pete Souza. Um, who was our amazing White House photographer. Um, in the Obama years. In the Obama years and Reagan years as well. Um, so he has perspective on both sides, but maybe sides where empathy was involved. <laughs> Remember that thing? Um, <laughs> that mattered in the White House. Um, <laughs> um, and isn't it funny that you always get super comfortable in the last like four minutes? <laughs> I'm like now opening my jacket and like, okay, let's talk about the White House. Um, <laughs> um, so really bring the questions on now. Oh, we gotta go. Uh, but, um, but you know, it's, it's an exciting time to, to tell stories and want to build stories that, that we feel like want to be seen and, and friends of ours bring projects who are, which are really exciting and matter at a time that there's so much opportunity mm -hmm. um, 
thanks to live streaming and, and sort of a reinvention of independent film from companies that can do it, like Netflix mm -hmm. in the case of uh, Noah Baumbach and Alfonso Cuaron and Scorsese, who are you know able to have their budgets and make the films they want to make and have complete autonomy and theatrical release. Um, and they're even now saving independent theaters. So, right. which is great. The Paris news. is now a Netflix theater and, yeah. and is showing Marriage Story. Yeah, so that's exciting. Hopefully more to come. It is interesting because these two films that you're in, um, they feel a little more like independent films. And you've been, of course, in blockbusters, Jurassic Park, and all of those films. But these feel like the kind of films that have a hard time getting made usually, but they're being made. Yeah, I mean, I think we are uh, finding our way back to what United Artists was doing by giving true autonomy to writer-directors. And, uh, you know, I think Netflix can, and so they're being incredibly supportive. And, um, you know, there was independent money and financing. Um, 10 years ago that isn't there anymore. So luckily these companies, and Amazon certainly is doing it, Apple is now going into this, this world more and more, um, that, that will hopefully help, uh, not only help keep that alive, but frankly build more and more. I mean, I think we've all been saying for 20 years, how is it that hard to make a $7 million movie mm -hmm. and easier to get a $60 million movie made? That made no sense to anyone, particularly working in independent cinema. Um, and so I think now there's, there's real opportunity that wasn't there before, and particularly in documentary film, which is really exciting. So you mentioned Citizen Ruth, which is one of your earlier films that I would say everyone should rediscover, in addition to Enlightened. And that really feels ahead of its time, too. You play a character who becomes pregnant and the abortion and anti-abortion forces pull in different directions. It's Alexander Payne's first film. Is there another film of yours that you would like people to rediscover? Because everyone has those in their career, something that sort of went under the radar for whatever commercial reason. Well, I would say definitely Citizen Ruth. Also, like Enlightened, incredibly timely politically. Um, I love that somehow Alexander Payne and Jim Taylor in the script um, found the ability to sort of send up both sides of controversy um, of any cause in America. Um, but it is a comedy about the abortion issue, which how they pulled that off um, and we got it made is, is uh, somewhat miraculous. And I am very proud of that character, um, who's just a uh, can of spray paint away from a good time at all times. <laughs> um, and I just adore her and learned so much from her. Um, Do you think it would be hard to get that film made today? Oh, yeah. I mean, again, I think, you know, perhaps Netflix could make it. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, to confirm a theatrical release for a film like that is, is you know, it's more divisive than ever. That. Mm -hmm issue with these outrageous bans, state by state bans. So I think that's why it's a really interesting movie to look at. Um, and what other movies of mine should you guys run home and see? Run okay, Enlightened. See. What was it again? Enlightened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Citizen Ruth, Marriage Story, Little Women. I mean, if you haven't seen everything David Lynch has ever made, you should. That's, yes, I, that's I believe true. that's required and you're in a viewing. lot of them. Yeah, um, but anything that I'm not in, I just think David is uh, yeah. maybe our only true Renaissance man um, in the arts right now. Someone who makes art all day long, every day, um, has an amazing art exhibit downtown right now, is, is making a record, is, you know, just made the newest Twin Peaks. We made a film together for three years on a Sony camcorder. There is no one like him. And he doesn't think about how others are going to perceive him. He's in the making of art. He's in it. And it's a, uh, an incredible and humbling gift to be around that kind of artist. 
And are you about to start making Jurassic World 3 too? Is that the rumor next thing has you do? it? <laughs> can you confirm that rumor? I I can confirm uh, that they are cooking it up, and we haven't read it yet. But I'm very excited at the idea because so. I like a dinosaur. <laughs> Who doesn't like a good dinosaur? <laughs> I well, miss those guys. Yes. Well. We could go on and on because you've had an amazing career, and we are out of time, but we are so grateful to you for talking to us so about it. So grateful to talk to all of you. It's been fun doing this. Thank you. For this yeah. amazing gift. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.